Welcome to Rates and Barrels. It is Thursday, January 20th. Derek Van Riper, you know, Saris, Bricciaroli here with you. Lots to get to today, even though we are still uh, waiting further progress in the ongoing negotiations between Major League Baseball and the Players Association. Some changes at Camden Yards, so we'll talk about how that might uh, impact hitters and pitchers in that park moving forward. Some big news that broke last week when we had our episode get uh, scrapped for a week. Uh, Rachel Belkovic named low A manager. That's the Tampa Bay Yankees affiliate, which is just an awesome uh, step forward again in the game that hopefully we see a lot more of that on the horizon. We'll talk about the implications there. And uh, I got a few questions that we'll get to at some point, but the main topic we're going to get to in about 15 minutes or so uh, looking at teams that did not make the playoffs in 2021 and making predictions for which of those teams will actually make the playoffs in 2022. So uh, lots to get to on this episode. On the Tuesday episode, Britt, Eno expressed some optimism about, about the th progress that could be made with both sides back at the table. And I'm just curious uh, to take your temperature on this matter. Where, where do you feel like we're at in the wandering through the off-season desert as this lockout goes up. Uh, I don't think we've moved much. Uh, I talked to a player who's very heavily involved yesterday for a little while, and um, it does seem like the, they're preparing an offer. It could be as early as Friday that the union sends back that offer. Um, you know, could leak into next week. He wasn't exactly sure. But um, it seems like if they get the owner's answer to what the union um proposes and it is again subpar and it again doesn't address many of the core issues the union is fighting for it's going to be a really long spring because how can you keep negotiating as this guy put it with people who simply are unwilling to negotiate it, you you just can't so i think this next round is really going to show us here if the owners don't come back with something and it doesn't seem like the owners really are feeling any kind of crunch as we get closer to the time when guys would have to get ready to go down to spring training. Um, their playbook is really to do nothing, continue to wait this out and hope that the players um, start to fold. I'm not as optimistic as Eno, um, I guess, just based on, uh, on that conversation. I don't see why the owners all of a sudden in mid January would, would act like um, the seat is hot and they have to get something done because their play this whole way through and I, I understand it from a negotiating tactic has been to delay, delay, delay. Yeah, I think that my optimism comes mostly from the fact that I think that uh, some of the weirder proposals are starting to fall away. Um, we're starting to kind of see where the battlegrounds are and what the discussions are. Like, um, I think that for the most part, you know, just cutting of a year of free agency on the players part. I mean, I understand uh, you know, cutting a year of team control. I understand that's that's an awesome uh, goal, uh, but it, like we don't we don't hear about it as much. Um, so I kind of feel like that's gone on the owner side. The stuff where they were like, "We'll pay you through war," or like you know, uh, you know, uh, we'll replace arbitration with this other terrible thing. Um, you know, those things are starting to go away. And if you kind of read between the lines on the last uh, uh, thing, it seems like you know as much as I don't think DH is worth that much. Uh, to the players, it seems like, uh, uh, you know, DH, NLDH, uh, and expanded playoffs have been in every single owner's proposal. Um, and uh, the the quid pro quo on the player side is make the minimum salary range. Um, and um, I was just looking at this minimum. What are the two the two things? Minimum salary Tanking. range. Okay. Um, no, the CBT. Uh, awesome. make the, make this minimum salary range and the CBT higher. Those are, those are the two ways that they see they can get more money, uh, being spent on free agents and, and get to money, more money to younger players. And so as that, uh, you know, the, the right now, the, the owner said 600 to 700 for the minimum salary and 214 for CBT. And the players said 245 for the CBT, uh, and, uh, 775 or 675 to 775 for the minimum from the minimum salary. Yeah, like am I crazy? Those like I feel like we're not that far apart. You know what I mean? Yeah, like I think I'm not I'm not suggesting smaller. this is do it in the middle. Like maybe the players need it on their side, but I'm just saying like we seem to be talking the same language now. 
Uh, it seems like we might get something like a minimum salary at 750, uh, a CBT at 225. The the one thing that the players don't want are these like more str- like the owners are like we need more stringent uh, you know penalties for first time goer overs or whatever CBT guys. Um, and I don't I don't think the players want that. So, but I I think that these are like we're starting to get closer to details as opposed to like hey let's get rid let's. You know, let's uh, everyone's a free agent after year two or like, you know, what I mean, like we're not we're not talking like the weirdo stuff anymore. Like it seems like things are sort of consolidating to like, OK, we're arguing about the CBT and the minimum salary uh, and the things we're giving you are, uh, are are this and this. You know, you're the most optimistic person I think I've heard in the whole sport um, because I, <laughs> I, I, I couldn't disagree more with you on this. Um, the the owners haven't even really submitted a proposal. Yeah, that's true. So how would, I mean, I don't feel good about spring training starting on time. It sounds like you do. Um, no, I no, no. I don't necessarily No, I, I feel good about a deal being made and like maybe not missing much uh, season. Okay. Gotcha. So you think spring I, training? I think that like February one was like, you know, has been circled as a date. Like, Oh my God, like we're not going to make February one. So, you know, I think there's, you know, but I think February 1 has made them speak the same language. Like, I think that we're starting to see negotiation. It's really hard to see see from the outside because we don't like the tenor. From what I've heard, you know, the tenor in the room is not very good. Uh, The the relationship is is kind of burnt. Uh, But also, uh, we're all just like sort of relying on leaks and here and there and that. And we, we don't like get to see everything. And yes, I do think it's a big deal that the owners haven't you know, given like an official proposal, but at the same time, like um, maybe that, maybe that doesn't matter at this point. Cause they're still just yammering about little things and this and that, like maybe we'll, we'll get more official proposals in the future. I don't know. It's like, it seems at least they're speaking the same language. Really? <laughs> well, we're not talking about, we're not talking about war. We're not talking about war anymore. Well, like, those are just talking... crazy early That's ideas. That's what I'm though. saying. Those are the, um, dumb ideas. the dumb ideas are out. And now the like brass taxes are being talked about. We, we've those moved from rumors, on the, on the dial. We, we were at not trying at all. Like we're just. That's what I'm like, saying. Like the total, move complete towards nonsense. Like, like not <laughs> solutions that are not even solutions. They're yeah, just exactly. thing that's just filling up space. We've gone from that to this is these are the elements of what a deal will eventually look like what that means for the timetable i think you're it's both to say, yeah. making good points i think what it comes down to is something that brit brought to my attention probably a month or so ago now maybe even a little longer is the player's ability to just keep waiting and waiting and waiting because in the past the owners have been able i think to benefit from just having extra pressure right like they've they've had players that simply couldn't wait it out as long or didn't wait out as long for a variety of different reasons. I think things could be different. The war chest that Britt talked about, the money that's been put aside for this purpose, that's really intriguing to me. The logistics of how that works, very intriguing also. I'm still very curious to know, like, how long would that money last? How, when would they actually turn to it? Like, how... How detailed are they in their planning with something like that? In Ken Rosenthal's column, there was like in caps, like this will not be anywhere close to your paycheck. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Like it's subsistence type stuff, like whoever needs help making the rent kind of deal. But, you know, I like what Britt reported. uh, Was it IBAT or something? What was the the facility? Yeah, DBAT. DBAT, DBAT, that's it. That that seems, that's that's hopeful to me. Um, Yeah. Yeah. and, and And our most recent fan survey came out. Uh, and I think that something that's a little bit different now than in the past is, uh, did you see the 63% or 64%, um, you know, favor the player side? Um, so I, I think with, with the majority of (laughs) fandoms sort of favoring the player side and there being some structure, uh, I think that as we get closer to losing season, I think that puts pressure a little bit more on the owners in, in fact. Yeah, and I know I the players low. have less money, but I, I think you're right. Low. Yeah, What's it that? is. It's still it's still, 60, still low. sixty only sixty three percent are on the player side. Like I know. Oh. It's still crazy. Who, which of these guys uh, is more like you in your life? <laughs> yeah, like I, like in, in realistically, yes, n- the, none of those people are really like you, but think real carefully about which side is more like you. 
60 uh, only 63 percent so it's crazy so there, you're still gonna get the the decent number of people a third of people probably just have no appetite for this entire conversation because they're like well these are the problems of people wealthier than me so i don't care it's like well this i ran is... into that a little bit on twitter last night uh, it, it comes just... up every time it, yeah. there's like this idolization of the owners that's the one where i really don't get there was this whole bit i got i stepped into some poo last night on twitter <laughs> and uh it was all this stuff about like the owners take risks i'm like do you know that like no team has ever been sold for a loss nobody bought a baseball team and then sold it and lost money on the whole idea it's hmm. not a risk to buy a baseball team in fact you have three four five ownership groups begging to buy any new team when they when they get it baseball gets to sort through ownership groups and say nah 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 okay maybe this guy you know they get to yeah. put they they get they put they put they put conditions on steve cohen buying it they told him he had to hire people come on yeah <laughs> come so, on and I think what makes baseball so intriguing over other teams is the revenue sharing if you're a smaller market team doesn't happen as much as it does in baseball. Also, they have the antitrust exemption, which no other pro team has. Yeah. Owning a baseball team in particular is incredibly it's like the lucrative. Safest. It's the safest. It's almost the safest investment there is. It's incredibly <laughs> lucrative. And I want to get back to this. So we talked about the war chest. So players don't normally get paid in spring training. So I think until this leaks into the season – most guys would probably be okay. Yes, they have to pay to live in their off-season home for another month or two versus the team but paying for them in But they've set training. up for that. They've set up uh, for that. They've always correct. known that they weren't going to get a paycheck until until April 1. Correct. So I think, you know, once the season is in jeopardy, you're really going to see kind of that, like, work but, just be put to the test. But the owners will be losing money because so, they exactly. usually get free labor in spring training where they exactly. actually get to sell tickets on all these guys that are not getting paid. Yep. Exactly. So spring training to some extent, and also they have great relationships with these cities in Florida and Arizona who have built these stadiums for them. Ooh, um, you the know, mayor's so calling. Just, yeah. The mayor's you calling. Know, we'll lose a lot of revenue here this year. Yeah. Um, so I, I do think, you know, once we get into it, if the players hold firm, you're going to see the owners um, actually take this seriously. Right now, I feel like they're still not taking things seriously. Uh, but again, that could change with the players' the next proposal. I think is going to be important if they get turned off again. We might see both sides go dark for another week or two because there's just no point in negotiating with a group that is clearly not interested in negotiating. Yeah. So if, if I had to kind of place where I am on the the Eno kind of optimistic scale and the Brit pretty pessimistic scale, I'm <laughs> I'm more like middle with one foot closer to Brit right now <laughs> because I just think it's gonna take it's gonna take some time. And it, it needs to take some time. It's it's for I'm not I'm I'm not necessarily arguing it's gonna happen super soon, but well yeah, maybe I'm just being the, the eternal optimist. Hey, that's I like all right. Positivity. We need we, it on this pod. Yeah, <laughs> we absolutely do. And look, it's not all bad. Good news last week. Rachel Balkovic named the manager for the low-A affiliate of the Yankees. She was a hitting coordinator for the previous two seasons, first female to manage a professional team. A step forward, we, we talked about this when Kim Ang became general manager of the Marlins, and we've seen it in other organizations in various roles. Women having a more prominent role in the game, it's only a good thing. It is the beginning of hopefully a much, much larger sea of change. And you know, I think this is interesting in some ways, too, because I I feel like organizations are starting to pull back and, and wonder, like, hey, was the old way in which we found managers at the big league level actually as effective or more effective than just taking someone with no managerial experience and plunking them into a big league seat? So I, I'm wondering if there's actually a better path to a, a big league dugout by actually doing the job in the minors at various levels than there was even just a few years ago because like Aaron Boone, right? I mean, sure. Family, family, uh, managerial experience. That doesn't count for him. He hasn't done the job, went from the booth to the dugout. I think teams are starting to question that a little bit more and looking at different ways to possibly develop the people who are going to be a part of their big league staffs and even be their big league managers. 
Yeah. I am. Um, I just think the way this has changed now, a lot of people that are coaches and managers, like you said, never played. So why would we keep women out when it used to be former players everywhere? And so like you kind of were like, okay, well, you never played. Well, you can't even use that excuse anymore because mm -hmm. a lot of these organizations have people that are very smart and never played or never played at any pro level anyway. So I think she's the 11th woman now um, this year that will have an on-field um, coaching position, which is super great. My, um, I don't want to call it concern. I think this is great news. I've known Rachel for about a decade. Uh, she's really into strength and conditioning. She was a strength trainer with Houston. Um, so we always kind of cross paths. She wants to be in the front office and I, I'm wondering why somebody with 10 years of experience who is a PhD uh, was unable to get a job in a team's front office. Uh, why she had to, uh, she never really wanted to manage and she was pretty open about that in her press conference that she wants to be a GM. That's her ideal goal. And the Yankees approached her with this and said, you know, we want you to manage. And, you know, I think it, it's great and all for the game. It's great for diversity. Uh, but to me, the little underbelly of this is like, why is someone like Rachel not in a front office yet? Um, I wonder if I showed you a resume of hers without her name on it, you know, many front offices would already have her as an assistant GM. Why, why um, if she wants to be a GM someday, has she had so much difficulty breaking into that front office? Didn't she say that she got more nibbles when she put her name as Ray on it? <laughs> Correct. That's, I mean, that's what I mean. You have, again, you have someone who's worked in a strength and conditioning capacity of someone who has, who speaks Spanish, who has a PhD, who has 10 years of experience in baseball, who can't get their foot in the door in the front office. So they accept this manager job. Um, yeah, like that's, again, un that's, that's unfortunate. See, right. Like it's a happy thing. It's a great thing. Um, you know, the first um, female manager in the minor leagues, I think that's wonderful. But I did hear from a lot of women kind of expressing that sentiment of um, why wasn't, why wasn't she in a front office somewhere? Those are, those are AGM, why is she an AGM or a VP of something or you know it's the same it's the same question I think if if you looked at Kim Eng's resume before the Marlins finally made her a GM there were plenty of times where she interviewed to be a GM and had the best resume and didn't get the job it's Correct. the same kind of thing it's, it's still the root problem is still in place even though we're we're seeing slow changes at various spots like it you're you're exactly right Britt like this is this is I didn't even realize like the, <laughs> I somehow, somehow I thought that on field instruction was, was also part of what she wanted to do too. And it's like, there's plenty of people in front offices who have zero on field experience because of their other experience. And she has that other experience. It, puzzling. Well, she, uh, she said some interesting things that uh, I think she's, she's going to end up um, she, she's going to show uh, that she's, got some skills there that can also be used in, in a front office. I mean, one thing that I that really stood out for me in her in her uh, introductory press conference is how she was talking about getting to know all the players and um, letting uh, people in her staff uh, do what they do best. So letting, uh, you know, letting the hitting coaches, the, letting the subject matter experts, letting the the sort of the 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 staff come together and do their jobs and, and everyone kind of and that her role was to kind of get to know all the players uh, and to make them feel comfortable. And uh, to me, that's <laughs> you've heard this on the show a million times. Like, that's what I think a manager does. I think a manager uh, is a manager of people and, and makes people feel comfortable. So uh, I, maybe I just heard what I was listening for, but I thought um, at least she's coming into this with uh, a, a, an interesting perspective. And it's not one I've necessarily heard um, every manager sort of say uh, to begin uh, their careers. Um, and then, uh, you know, there is a bit of a uh, back and forth of the Red Sox. I think the Red Sox have two or three women uh, in the minor leagues. Uh, they're not necessarily uh, like, you know, managers um, like Rachel, but uh, I like this. I like, I feel like there's almost like an arms race situation here. And I point to uh, research uh, in the uh, corporate environment that uh, diversity is not necessarily always for diversity's sake. Diversity has been proven, diversity and leadership has been proven uh, to have better outcomes for, for corporations. Um, and so 
uh, hopefully this is a bit of an arms race to consider that aspect of, uh, you know, your team as a corporation and to have uh, diverse backgrounds. It was something we touched on in the AGM piece that, um, you know, hopefully uh, the AGM title allows for uh, doesn't isn't what isn't like a glass ceiling that's keeping people down and, you know, hiring your friends. Maybe that can be an opportunity uh, to get more diverse leadership in. Uh, maybe these manager roles in the minor leagues are, are an opportunity. Um, you know, it, everything has to build over time. Um, and so I, I think this is, it's still a positive. Yes. Yeah, so there is that kind of that cloud over it uh, is like, why, is, why isn't she higher up the food chain yet? But, you know, at least uh, things like seem to be moving slightly in the, in the right direction. Yeah. And I get the sense that this will be, a springboard to something bigger and better and hopefully much more in line with those long-term goals that, uh, that she was referring to. Let's get to uh, some other changes uh, around the league changes to Camden yards. Britt, you've seen a ton of baseball at Camden yards. It's been a extreme hitters <laughs> park for a long time. Some of the analytics people in the front office were saying it's probably the most extreme Homer environment, at least for right-handed hitters in the big leagues. The numbers bear that out. You know, we've known that for a long time from a fantasy perspective, uh, just thinking about that park being more neutral, it, it seems like it would it would give them more of a lift in the future than it would immediately. Because as we've talked about on this show, they're not going anywhere in 2022. But if you were a free agent pitcher and considering similar offers and Baltimore versus a more neutral environment was uh, something you had to think about, well, especially on a short term deal, Baltimore in the past was probably kind of a non-starter for someone in that position. So I'm just curious what you think about these changes. Good idea, long overdue. Uh, where where do you sit on these? Yeah, I think it's a great idea. Um, it gives them a chance to compete in the future because they were never going to be able to get top tier starting pitching free agents to go there. The last really good starting pitcher they had, and this also – happened from within too. They would develop guys and guys would get absolutely hammered at home and you're really hurting the development of young pitching. And they haven't really had an actual like bona fide ace since Mike Mussina. Um, so you're really going back quite a ways when you look at that. So I've seen a lot of cheap balls fly out of Camden Yards and I think this helps them much more than it hurts them because if they're going to compete in the American League East, we've talked about this before, it has to come from within. It has to come from this long rebuild Yes, they can pluck a free agent from here or there, uh, but to be able to have sustained success, you have to pitch. You have to pitch. And they're not able to, you're not able to pitch well uh, given the dimensions of that park. So I think this really is a smart move by the front office. You know, they did all the numbers out. They looked at the advantages, the disadvantages to doing something like this. And I think it's going to open up uh, a bigger channel for them. I mean, it's crazy, guys. You look at numbers of like Wade Miley when he was in Baltimore, and then the following year he had like a renaissance year. This happened all the time. These guys would look like they're gossiping over. Yes, exactly. Bundy. Um, it would just be like, God, this guy's terrible. And they ran this guy up the flagpole, and then he'd be somewhere else and he'd be great. Now, part of it is development. Baltimore's still behind. I think, you know, you pointed that out. Uh, but part of it is just every ball in the air. It seemed like that was going out to left field was out. And that's really a tough thing to develop a young pitcher in the American League East um, that's afraid to give up any kind of contact uh, in the air to that direction at all. It changes the way you pitch. It changes your confidence. And it forced guys like Gossman to continue to tinker with stuff like mid-start. Gossman would wake up and tell us post-game he changed his delivery. I mean, that is not a good thing. Like, that's just crazy that these guys are literally thinking about how do I fix this today? Let's do this in a big league start. Um, this happened all the time. And it, you know, it was jarring. Jake Arrieta, another guy could have put it together in Baltimore has a Cy Young season in Chicago. Um, so I think that this long term really helps Baltimore. Yeah. It's funny when you, uh, when you run numbers, um, you know, Andrew Perpetua ran some numbers and we're going to uh, do a piece on, um, uh, on what this uh, would look like, you know, in brass taxes, like what, what would John means is ERA have been last year, that sort of deal. And you know, how this would have affected the team. Um, and if it would have affected their hitters more than their pitchers. Um, but the, the, the way that things work, work in the aggregate are really interesting. So, um, perpetua says like, uh, okay, uh, this will, this will reduce, 
uh, homers to that area of the field by 40%. You're like, wow, that's a lot. Well, okay. So it's, it's only, you know, 20% of the whole, right? It's not even the whole outfield. So that gets reduced. Uh, it ends up being about 10% of the whole. So you, you'd reduce homers 10%. And um, it ends up being about 40 homers a year. And that includes home and away. So you're going to take 20 homers away uh, from your from your visitors as a pitcher. And yet, it is a big deal. And it is, it's like it, perspective changes everything, right? Like 20 overs uh, in the life of a park over the course of a year is, is not that much, but it, it also could be. I mean, if you look at John Means's homers last year uh, that he allowed, he would like lose like six or seven. And for him, that's, that's huge. <laughs> like take six or seven homers off John Means's line. And, you know, he had something like a, like a 290 ERA last year if you, you do that. So, um, you know, it's uh, it, 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 I, I, I'm fascinated to see like how this actually impacts each of the players. Um, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if Trey Mancini actually doesn't lose that many homers. He's got kind of a line drive, ground ball, you know, heavy approach. He's kind of a, a guy that hits for a good average. Uh, you know, is he going to hit maybe 23 homers instead of 25? Maybe they looked at their hitters and say, we're not going to hurt our hitters that much and we'll help our pitchers a lot. So maybe it actually will help their team be more competitive on paper as well as the stuff that Britt's talking about, which I totally agree with. Like, yeah, in terms of developing a pitcher, uh, in terms of signing a pitcher, as you were saying, DVR, like nobody. Yeah, I was talking to um, Brandon McCarthy once just about just random stuff. And then he just started talking about how much he hated Coors Field. <laughs> did, like I had I said nothing about Coors Field, you know, it's like that meme, you know, nobody, nobody. <laughs> Brandon McCarthy, course field sucks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, uh, you know, I feel like that Baltimore is probably the same way where it's like, I will take, I will take less money uh, to go somewhere other than Baltimore and course field. And you just don't want that because as a, as a general manager or as a person running a team, you want to catch values wherever they come. Uh, you don't want to cut yourself off anywhere. So I think it was, this is also part of a larger trend you'll see of the homogenization of ballparks. So uh, San Francisco, the stated goal was to get the bullpens off the field uh, because that was a health hazard. And, you know, I believe them, but also, hey, look, we're a little bit less crazy pitcher park than we used to be. You remember San, San Diego changed the walls to become yeah. less pitcher friendly. Seattle changed the walls to become less pitcher friendly. New York changed the walls to become less pitcher friendly. So, you know, everybody's trying to kind of at least be neutral enough that nobody thinks I'm, you know, I'm not signing there. Look at what uh, St. Louis has had to do to get hitters. They've had to do uh, big package trade packages uh, to get hitters into their ballpark. Uh, you know, I think if I was a free agent hitter, I might not necessarily uh, be itching to, to hit in St. Louis. Yeah. So. I'm sorry. The health hazard should really be reserved for Oakland and Tampa Bay. Those bullpens are serious health hazards. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're the, are they the last two that have them on the field now? Like literally on the side. Yeah. Like guys well, that's, that's where up, San Francisco was. Yeah. Yeah, the, yeah. Somebody, somebody uh, got a concussion. It was pretty bad. I forget who it was. Yeah. Darren Roof. Somebody was uh, trying to catch a ball in San Francisco, got a concussion. And then everyone's like, we need to get rid of these. <sighs> Yeah, they but they are health allowed. hazards, right? If you're an outfielder, yeah. you're running, and all of a sudden there's a mound. However, the the foul territory and Buck used to talk about this all the time. The amount of foul territory they have versus other parks is a huge advantage because you can make outs in foul territory versus a ball that's all of a sudden in the third row, mm -hmm. right? So there's a lot of advantages to having that more foul territory, which I thought was fascinating. I don't know who has the most foul territory, but it'd be Oakland. curious. Uh, do they? But I'd be yeah. curious when you look but at Tampa's, like how many Tampa's outs. Tampa's second, I think. Tampa's right there. How many foul ball outs they have versus anybody else. Oh, so, so many things. more. But one it's thing crazy. that I couldn't, I, I looked into this one. One thing I couldn't find was a home field advantage in those outs. So people made outs equally. However, I think you can probably still have a team building advantage, right? Where you're like, oh, we're our pitchers are just going to do better because they're going to get a lot more foul outs. Yeah. So, you know, yes. we should invest in hitting or we should we should know that our pitchers are going to do well. I don't know. It seems like Oakland and Tampa both kind of take for granted that there'll be fewer runs scored in their in their in their in their park and the, the foul ground is part of that and they've found ways to build around that, I think. 
Yeah, totally. Guys would fight like on the Orioles about who was pitching in Tampa because guys just love pitching there. Yeah. Right? Like, <laughs> where do you rather like, pitch? Tammy Yards, Tampa. Like, come on, your ERA is a big deal. Um, yeah. But like when the Oakland trades for somebody like Cole Irvin, Cole Irvin doesn't have great stuff. He does have five pitches. You know, he has some good command. If you tr- if you put Cole Irvin in Colorado, you put Cole Irvin in the on the Yankees. Uh, I think it would not go well. Uh, but you put Cole Irvin in Oakland, put Cole Irvin in Tampa. You know, uh, you, you you've got a pitcher that can that can be your number four, or number five. And they didn't pay that much uh, to get him in a trade. So that's my kind of uh, example of of how Oakland has taken it to their advantage, but it, it doesn't show up in, in outs. Like I was like, they have Josh Donaldson and Matt Olson. Don't they, this or before uh, Olson, but I was like, don't they have Josh Donaldson? Don't they have an advantage in home field foul, foul outs? And they didn't necessarily. Hmm. Yeah. It's, that's pretty strange. They didn't have an advantage from that, but yeah, the changes in Camden yards, about 26 feet is the difference where they're going to have the left field wall. So, you know, some of those home runs will turn into long outs. Some of those will be doubles, doubles off the wall, maybe maybe a triple or two. So it's not it's not all going to be just in favor of the pitcher, but definitely better than better than the home runs that have been a problem, especially for lefties. And maybe one more reason to like Grayson Rodriguez when the time comes for him to be a big league starter as well. Damn, you're going to make me regret that pick. Every episode for the rest <laughs> of my life. <laughs> I took Mike Soroka over Grayson Rodriguez. Ah, He's going to... You're, You're gonna fine. remind me of that all year. You'll but if I okay. get it right, I'm gonna remind you of it. As you should. Yeah, you'll forget. <laughs> <laughs> I will forget. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on to uh, some teams that might have improved fortunes in 2022. The goal here: we're looking for teams that did not make the playoffs last season, who will make the playoffs this season. I'm going to start with a trivia question for you because I know you both love trivia questions. The good news is you can play together. You're, you're working together. It's you two versus me. And what I'm looking for by wins above replacement, I want the five highest non playoff teams at this point. So, you know, Dodgers and okay. Yankees are one and two. They were obviously playoff teams. There's five non playoff teams within, well, and ended up being the league's top 12 by projection as of right now with all the moves that have happened to this point. It's got to be the Mets as one. They are they're number three. Yep, they were the highest of the non-playoff teams a year ago. You know, what do you think about the the Blue Jays? I have to I have to recuse myself. But did you already? Uh, he's look already this up? he's already looked at it. Did you look okay. this well, up? You, no, I didn't. I didn't know exactly what the trivia question would be. He told me to my preparation for the segment of who is a contender that was is to look at the depth charts and look at the war projections. <laughs> so I just have to be looking right at it when he just said it. And I was like, uh, I could just read out what I'm looking at right now. Oh, but you were right. Mets was a great one. And the Blue Jays. There you go. Is the Blue Jays another one? Yeah. For two, they're, get, get they're four and five. I think they're four and five in terms of projected for the postseason. Yep. They're, they're up there. So you get two out of the first five, two, you're two for two so far, three more to go. I'm kind of leaning toward the Padres because, like, they're a very talented mm. team. They're Nailed in there, it. right? Yep, yeah. they're in there too. Yeah. I'm no I longer not- looking, so my guess is Philly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Phillies are the fourth. Oh, because- I wouldn't. I would not have picked the Phillies. Good one. I, I, yeah, uh, there, I, I knew there was no way you'd pick the Phillies. Like it, it, it's just. <laughs> what? It's just the, I don't hate the Phillies. I know, <laughs> but it, it's you don't you don't hate them. But I don't think you respect them. <laughs> what have they done lately to earn my respect? <laughs> That's what I'm saying. It's just like you're fair, just... fair, fair. You know what? That would be great on a T-shirt. Like I don't hate your team. I just, I just don't respect, don't respect team. them. <laughs> Another that's a, that's one of our best T-shirt ideas yet. That one that's all you, Britt. We should definitely make I those. Like Could we make uh, it in each team's color combination too? Oh, that'd be amazing. So it, like you could, so someone like me could go to a Phillies game and wear their colors and just blend in randomly, and it actually is just kind of like I don't hate your team, but I don't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so who the well, last? How many we have left? One team done? left. You're four for four, and you've got them in order so far in terms of their projected war, which is even Crushing more impressive. It. Yeah. Uh, oh, which you know, you know, I didn't look up war before this started. <laughs> but but this is the most difficult one of all. Like, the, it, yes, really? because 
because the Phillies are projected to be like around 500 or like a little bit above 500. I think I've called this team the Phillies of the AL at some point. So I'll give you one hint. It's an AL team. It's an AL team. Yep. Phillies of the AL. Angels? Angels, yes, a team that <laughs> spends money and should be more successful than it is. I think that's a I think it's a fair description. Have of some the good Angels. players. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes project okay, never Can't play well. Pitch. They're not yeah. rubbish. They have <laughs> legitimate playoff aspirations. I mean, so so my mind probably works a little too similarly to Eno's where the first thought <laughs> yeah, I had obviously was, I just looked right at your list. <laughs> so it's kind of like okay, I'm just yeah. Give my opinion. <laughs> yeah. We're that's not, how my mind works. We're not limited to these five teams, and I think each of us can throw one in there officially. Well, there's we also overlap. player movement left. I, you right. know, I was texting with a player about like how crazy it's going to be when the doors are open again. Right. So there's a few teams that were not in this group that are not that far behind that are still in the range of being the caliber of teams that were in the playoffs in 2021. The, by the way, the worst playoff team based on current projected war going into 2022, the Giants. Not a surprise given how much they... They sort of pop and exceeded expectations a year ago. So you could choose any team you want that didn't make the playoffs last season. I just thought that'd be a good starting point for some teams that we thought were either playoff contenders or certain playoff teams last year that didn't end up making it. Britt, we'll go to you first. Yeah, I'm racking my mind right now. See, I always lean toward the weaker divisions because that gives you a chance for a team to sneak in. And it always seems like the AL Central and NL Central are just weaker divisions, you know? So, like, could the Twins be a playoff team if they made the right moves here? Wouldn't really surprise me, you know, just because of that division. I think I look at it in terms of um, how... What the Tigers to come together quickly? Tigers you know? was another one I was going to say. Like, like, you know, you have to look at, like, the division. And if there's no, like, powerhouse one or two, like, in the ALEs, like, could the Red Sox surprise again? Maybe. But it's like, look how good... The Yankees and Blue Jays are going to project are projected to be, and the Yankees are you know are going to spend money. They need a shortstop. Uh, they need to probably fill out that rotation a little bit. Um, so it's like okay, they probably don't have a chance. You look at um, you know the NL West, and you're like, oh, the Padres are going to be good. You know, the Giants will probably still be good, even though nobody thinks you know they're going to be able to repeat what they did. Um, so yeah, I go by like kind of divisions, and an AL Central team could maybe surprise me. Same thing in the NL, the NL Central. You know. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's just hard to pick. You guys hated on the Cardinals last year, and they won like twenty games in a row. Yeah. So the Uh, NL Central is weird because uh, I'm actually working on an episode with each of the beat writers in that division of the Athletic Baseball Show, and it's we're going team by team and kind of trying to figure out what these teams are going to do once they can make moves again. That is that is a division across the board that everyone could mostly sit on their hands. It could be a few trades, minor signings, but. As you try and project where the best remaining players in free agency go, they all tend to end up on a team that's not in that division. Mm. And I think as a result, like you, you do have at least two kind of obvious contenders with the Brewers and Cardinals. But then you have the Cubs, depending on what they do, they could just hang around and, and maybe be good enough just because the division's weak. What if they surprise us and sign Korea? I mean, it, it, like, that's, it's not it, impossible. It, the Cubs they, have no, money. It's not. They could do it's it. Not. It's not impossible. And the Yankees is not a lock. I yeah. mean, there's there's some, yeah, it's interesting. Or even, I mean, even story to the Cubs would be a big deal because the Cubs, like, if you made Horner and Madrigal, like, more depth pieces than your middle, starting middle infield, like, you might, that might improve the team a lot. Yeah. 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 I, so I, I just think that division, it's it's up for grabs if anyone wants to put more effort into making their roster better. And yet it feels like many of those teams are going to be, they're going to choose to be limited in the the upgrades they get. So the Mets are the one that sort of jump off the page in terms of projection, but it, it's the NL East is still, I think a reasonably tough division. The Nats are down right now. The Marlins are getting better. I think that's, that's pretty clear in these numbers too. The Marlins could be, if you put the Marlins in one of the central divisions, I think you could talk yourself into them as a 2022 playoff team a little bit easier. I think in the NL East, more difficult to see it right now. But Britt, you don't want to put your name on the Mets in 2022 as a playoff team, do you? Well, I do go on SNY and people feel like I hate on the Mets a lot. So <laughs> Another, the blue uh, and orange, oh, that Mets shirt would sell like crazy. Oh, it really would. I don't hate your There's a couple of reasons I just don't respect them. <laughs> somebody, somebody needs to make these. 
that mm. there's a few things with the Mets that convinces me that maybe they won't be like the LOL Mets. The, the first has to be Buck Showalter, who has like brought accountability and winning to everything. Um, and, you know, people have different opinions on him. I saw him up close for eight years. I saw what he did in that clubhouse. I saw what he did with an organization that was laughed at. Um, I think he's going to be really good there. The staff they've assembled, I think, is really strong. And I think when you ask, add a guy like Max Scherzer, you get automatic accountability. He's a guy who's going to police the clubhouse the same way Buck is going to change the, you know, the culture around the team. Max Scherzer is going to set the tone. I mean, he's out there doing crazy running routines and punishing things days before he starts. And it kind of rubs off on other guys like, boy, Max is out there doing some stuff. Maybe I should do some stuff. You know, I think um, those those were two big impact moves. And when you have an owner who's willing to spend, I, I know the Braves are going to be good, too. Um, but I just don't know how the Mets fall apart like they did this year again uh, with some of the moves that they made. I like the, the addition of Marte. Um, I think they're going to be just a, a much better, more well-rounded team, and I don't think they're done yet either. I think they have another move or two in them when the, the floodgates open, so to speak. Yeah, that's interesting. The two things that I was thinking about were, um, you know, I, I like that their moves so far have created depth by signing starters. Basically, they push Dominic Smith, Jeff McNeil, uh, those guys into depth roles. And that's pretty amazing. Those are good depth, good depth players. Also give them some options maybe for a trade to get like a fifth starter or something. Um, but the other thing I'm thinking of is that, you know, of like we name these teams, right? To my my guess is that the teams we named are mostly done. Hmm. Now, I think you might be right. Maybe the Mets have one more move in them. But it is interesting that this is the the, the war depth charts are a snapshot in time and that we have, I would say, at least sort of 10 to 15 really good free agents left, you know, that can actually move the needle for a team. And that of the teams we mentioned, it's not likely that they're going to sign any of those 10 to 15 free agents. Mm -hmm. Right. The I, only I think... one I can think of is like Kimbrel to the Phillies seems like, like a, a total possibility, but I don't think they have enough money to sign, you know, a big free agent. Well, the Padres should, should make a move here because they really haven't done anything. Yeah. But they were right up. They, they went over the lugs tax last year. Yeah. That's yeah. true. Yeah, they're, that's they're, true. Sitting, they're sitting here... right near that line. I here's think they the signed like an outfielder for $10 million and that might be it. Yeah, you're right. But here's the other thing I keep coming back to at the Mets, you guys. DeGrom and Scherz are atop your rotation just prevents really long losing streaks. Oh, yeah. No, no. I think I think if I – of all the teams that we talked about that haven't made it, I, I'm picking the Mets, you know? Because, the, like you said, the Blue Jays are in a tough, tough division. The Padres are in a tough, tough division. You know, those are the other two – That's the those three are the chalk picks, and the Mets have the easiest road. Uh, of mm -hmm. the three so you know i think that's that's a smart pick but i did want to bring up that like you know correa is still a, a needle mover um mm -hmm. you know i forget who you know story i think could could be a really big pickup for somebody uh, there's still yeah. there's still some good names out there and then kimberl is still out there to be moved so whoever you think has like an okay bullpen that needs to get better like you know the phillies i think would get a fair amount better with kimberl because they already got knievel so now you got you know, now you have an actual, you know, good looking bullpen, maybe. So. All right. So we, we all agree on the Mets, by the way, I, I'm in. I, I think I like the moves they've made to this point for all the reasons you guys mentioned. Even if DeGrom struggles to stay healthy, the addition of Scherzer gives them so much more cushion in the rotation than they had before that addition. Like there's plenty to like here. So the Mets are, are one of the teams that we're putting in as a new playoff team. If we can try to pick a second one. I would like to make a case for the Angels because I am stupid. I think the Angels, they have the star power. But coming off a season where Anthony Rendon and Mike Trout missed, I think, a billion games combined was the official total. I'm not sure if I'm doing the math right. But if you get Trout back for 130 plus games and you get Rendon back for 130 plus games, so I'm, I'm baking in one reasonable IL stint for each player. You keep Otani healthy for another season and you get even. 80% of what you got from him in 2021. That, that could be like a seven wing. I mean, just getting Trout and Rendon back, that could be like an extra seven wins that you didn't have last year. It's you got to right pitch though. I mean, I know they got Syndergaard, but you got to get another pitcher. You've got to overload your pitching because they never have enough of it. Agreed. They got to make I, another move. 
Agreed. I, I'm I'm totally on board with getting more pitching. But I do think they have at least rotation. one more big move in them. Same. If not two. It might be I they're I don't think they're in the, the Correa level, even though they have spent big in free agency in the past, to see them add another what three hundred million dollar type player to the mix doesn't quite seem where they'd go. But I do think the Trevor Story million. scenario could work. 50 million for, you know, yeah. 50, 60 million, you know, story or Rodone. I'm calling it story or Rodone is going to the angels. Yeah. Oh, Rodone, can, I think it's a better, better solution, but yeah. It, I mean. But if they, if they, if they only do Rodone, they don't do story. Uh, then Luis Renjifo or uh, Fletcher are their starting shortstops. Can't you get like a stopgap guy like um, Andres? Uh, um, Bring Simmons I, back. Like, bring yeah, Simmons back. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. I mean, can you get a stopgap? That would be what the Yankees would do if they don't get a story or Correa because they have those hotshot young prospects. Right. I don't know if the Angels have any prospects on the horizon in their infield. Um, but, you know, they're, I mean, the Yankees could easily get. I think for some teams, story is a much better fit. Less money. Um, you could get him for less of a commitment. And there's, I think there's a lot of upside to kind of seeing what he, what he's able to do away from Colorado. I think, I, I think, I, yeah, no, I think stories are, fit. I think story is a, is a really great pickup, but the one, the reason I had voting against the angels is that I think they were maybe the worst organization in baseball with regards to player <laughs> development and how they handled uh, COVID and the, and the lockdowns. Uh, they pretty much just fired all their player development staff. They didn't stay in touch with any of their players. Uh, they didn't pay their minor leaguers. Um, and I think, uh, that's a whole, I think they lost more from that shutdown year than almost anyone. Uh, I think their stable of prospects is, you know, fairly barren. Um, and in terms of a player development pipeline, in terms of the best data and tech, in terms of, uh, you know, having ready to go players, um, I think it's Adele and Marsh and that's it. So, I mean, it's nice Adele and Marsh. I mean, you know, one of those guys could click and then this is, this will be a really great offense, but um, you know, you're going to really see it on the pitching side. If, if Sandoval takes a step back uh, you know, I don't see anybody stepping in for him. I think the starters I believe in there though, Otani, a healthy cinder guard, we know is an impact guy. It's still a fair question to see if he gets all the way back to what he was pre-injury. Reed Detmers had a, pretty disastrous big league arrival last year, but he's supposed to be the most big league ready starter in that draft class in 2020. So it wouldn't be, wouldn't be that surprising if he ended up being a good mid rotation or back end sort of guy like that. That's not, that's not asking too much of of Reed Detmer. So they're, they're closing in. Uh, They added Aaron loop and they brought back rice. Iglesias. They added Michael Lorenzen. So their bullpen is actually probably a little better than it was already last year. I don't know. I, I see I see lots of reasons for optimism, but I do think what Eno is describing to me, like compared to teams like the Dodgers and the Giants, the Mets that we were just talking about, the depth does not stack up. They can't we, we saw it unravel because of injuries last year. That's that's exactly how it unravels on them again, because they don't have the Lamont Wade, Tyro Estrada, that that they end up shopping depth. in the Adam Eaton buckets. Yeah, and you don't want to shop in the now, Adam Eaton right? bucket. Isn't he a coach there now, or he's going to be? That I, 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 that, I, that, that one just really surprised me. I never got the I, sense I, that I Adam Eaton was a like a well liked. That's what player. I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> the players I talked to do not like Adam Eaton. So I don't, there you go. Maybe oh, I, I think, mean Madden I must think, like him. Uh, <laughs> I think having covered him as a player, because you guys didn't. Do you guys really get to know him? No. Right. no, no the, the, the story, I, him. I heard a story about him when he was coming up in the Diamondback system where he, he stepped into the box and he tried to like talk up the catcher. Just kind of like, hey, what's going on? And the guy didn't say anything. And he, he got kind of mad. And he's like, I'm going to be a pain in your ass all day today. And it's like just that like wants to kind of just fight people all the time sort of mentality. Always always just getting at it with people. Yeah. I, I don't know. Like there's just something like like part of that attitude can be good. I almost wonder if he's the kind of teammate that you only like because you don't have to play against him. And playing against <laughs> him, you're just like, oh, this guy's the worst. He's but fine on I, my side. I, I, he's I our a-hole. Like, yeah. I think that's it's, the, that's it's, the vibe it's either, 
I think it's either you really like him or you really don't, and there's really no in between. And mm. part of that, like, Mighty Mouse type of stuff you were describing is because he was such a late round draft pick. Sure. And nobody thought he was going to go anywhere, and he's a small guy. And so I think he embraced that, like, you know, me against everybody and never really, even when he was in the big leagues for a while, got away from that. So, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting. I also never saw him as being someone who wanted to coach. Um you know, like Howie Kendrick going to the Phillies, I understood. He was a really great mentor for a lot of the younger players. Uh, him and Adam Eaton actually are very close, and it's very random because they're not similar at all. But um, I never saw Adam Eaton as somebody who, like, you're like, ah, that guy's going to coach one day soon. So, yeah, I was also very surprised by that. Do you have anybody else we could throw out there, though? I mean, the Mets were pretty obvious. The Jays, I think we – all like them it's just more of yeah. not being as confident in predicting any team to come out of the al east and make the playoffs because there's four playoff caliber teams yet again do you want to make a case for anybody else i got uh, i got i got i raised my hand uh right. i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna talk for the phillies a little bit here okay uh the phillies have uh across the board uh above average players um and some stars and their biggest weaknesses um, are areas that are easy to fix. Their big, biggest weakness is left field and uh, and the bullpen. So I could see them going and getting um, uh, going and getting uh, Kyle Schwarber and Craig Craig, Craig Kimbrell. Keg Kimbrel would be uh, a, a Keg. upgrade. Keg, Keg, Keg. Uh, and uh, Keg and if you put those two on that team. I don't know. That's actually pretty exciting. I, that's a good lineup. It's a really good lineup. It's a better bullpen. You know, you want a resurgence from Aaron Nola. I don't know. Some things to like there. Yeah, their starting pitcher war, Philly's starting pitcher war is second only to the Mets right now. Pretty that is you, actually a lot like, better than I would have guessed. And you got Harper coming off of an MVP season. So, you know, yeah. You mean just, in the... In the NL, I've got it says here on the Mets, Brewers, Phillies in the NL. Yeah, for some reason, the way this table is, it's got the Phillies to tick a half win over the Brewers. But I ran this in early December, so maybe something. Oh, okay. Tweaked. Nola, Wheeler, Gibson, Suarez, Eflin. I think that's a it's a fine five. The depth is a little bit questionable with Kraus and Falter, but uh, I mean, there's there's some guys there. All right, all right. So, so Ido and I have uh, thrown ourselves out. It'd be there a team that ridiculous predictions that are not made it a little bit more on offense than pitching. But <laughs> I don't right. think they're that bad. They're both ranked in the top five. They weren't crazy predictions. I, th I think. Yeah. Would you? Do you want to go off the board? Do you want to go outside that top five, Britt, and and share a hallucination with us? No, I don't want to go outside that board. I want to stay in that board. That board <laughs> seems like the safe space. Um, I like. That. I like. Okay, let's yeah. all pick. Let's all pick like I a like really it. weird one. I, I'm picking the Tigers. That's my right. really weird. You gotta pick one. A, a really weird one. Yeah, just I like that. The, you, just to make the playoffs. Yeah, and you just and you it, convinced yep. me actually with your and actually we should do this because it might be a fourteen team field. So like, I'm gonna <laughs> go. I'm gonna go with somebody. the twins then. I'm gonna go with the twins. Nice. I think that's and we're we're doing some similar reasoning. You convinced me on the like division. Uh, the reason I'm picking the Tigers is uh, I don't like the Javi Baez deal long term, but in the short term, it's a it's a great boost for their offense. And I see a bunch of pitching there that if they if they sort of came together, if some of those guys, if like Scooble takes another step forward or Manning, um, you know, takes a step forward, like I think that could really uh, change that team. So, yeah, and like plus Riley team. Green and Spencer Torkelson, like they, yeah. they might start from day one. They're going to be good soon. It's just a matter of how soon, right? Is it going to yeah. be this year or is it going to be in the future? I agree with you. They're set up really well. Is I your... think you look at the Twins. And they've massively underperformed this past year. Everyone thought they were going to be a playoff team. So, you know, you look at, at the fact that they haven't really made any moves. They probably have a couple moves in them here mm -hmm. during this frenzy. They're going to have to make some moves. And they're in a really weak division. So why not? Why not? Yeah. I, I think people are kind of down on them because they started so poorly and never got out of the gate. Uh, but you look at their roster and there's still plenty of talent there. There's still plenty of potential there. If they make the right moves in the offseason, no, I think the front office is very savvy. I think Rocco Baldelli does a great job as a manager. Um, I think they could be kind of a, a sleeper team. I'm actually on board with that one for sure, just because I, I do think they have some stars within that group of position players. I think the key for them is figuring out a way 
to exceed expectations with pitching with whatever mix of the old veterans they brought in prospects coming up that that's part of their story it's not just will they ever spend money on a starting pitcher you know like will they would they i was like what if you put rodon on that team that'd be different but it doesn't they're not that type of team they don't spend money on pitching no i mean they spend it on donaldson a few years ago yeah but you know they'll spend it on hitting yeah but yeah i just don't see them spending money on pitching so you know, yeah, where is that coming from? Who's going to break out? Is it Joe Ryan? Does Joe Ryan throw like 160 innings of like 350 ball? It's possible, I guess. It's possible. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it, it's easier to see it. And if you think back to expectations a year ago, you can definitely make it happen. Who's your weirdo? I'm going to go with the Reds as my weirdo. I mean, it, uh. if, we're, if we're saying the centrals are soft, it, the Reds are in this weird spot where they seem like a team that has no interest in spending any more money they seem more likely to trade a good player away than to <laughs> trade young talent away for an established good player. So I'm saying this even knowing that, well, Sonny Gray could be pitching somewhere else, right? All these pitching desperate teams we're talking about might send some prospects to Cincinnati, and Cincinnati might say, we're fine with Castillo and Molly and San Martin and Green and Lodolo. We're going to go a little younger in the rotation. And maybe he brings back money. somebody that we've, we we slot in there ahead of them. Yeah, maybe they do something like that. But the division, okay, the division is soft enough where it, it opens the door for any team that's even close to contend. I would say the Reds are they're comparable to the Giants in terms of how they're projected. Good pitching, mm. not enough hitting. There are a few hitters I actually like as possible bounce back guys. A full season of a healthy Jesse Winker. I was on the Turn 2 podcast on Wednesday night. A full season of Jesse Winker could be an MVP level season. That is a ceiling he has. Like three, 300, and, 300 average, like 35 homers. That's the forecaster box that baseball, uh, the baseball forecaster had for him. Totally possible that he could do that. We saw Jonathan India break out last year. Maybe you get something from Jose Barrero at shortstop this year. If Kyle Farmer doesn't work out, who wants to bet against Joey Votto? I certainly don't. Losing Nick Castellanos is, it hurts you, but replacing a corner outfielder is something you can actually do. We were just talking about the Phillies possibly adding someone like Kyle Schwarber. I think if the Reds were to make a move, it's one bat that fills a corner, a cheap replacement for Castellanos. And I can talk myself into, if they just stick with what they have and add one little piece Suddenly, they're a team that can hang around, maybe win 85 games and come the trade deadline. Then they add a couple more pieces to fix their flaws. Yeah, I, I like it. I mean, they even have this extra piece of Mike Moustakis that, you know, is not on any depth charts, you know. <laughs> and you're just like, no, he's not done yet. He could he could have a resurgence. That could maybe push India to the outfield uh, for, for the short term. Um, and and uh, and kind of uh, paper over that that missing spot. You definitely have that one missing spot in the in the corner outfielder. Uh, you know, I think that uh, Kyle Bode did a pretty good job of of, of you know putting together uh, some pitching in his short term there, and uh, all their all their guys uh, did really well over COVID, and you know they didn't miss a beat, and that's why you're seeing Reaver San Martin and Tony Santian and all these guys come up with 90 pitches and ready to go. So. Um, you know, I think uh, I think there's something there. All right, it's unfortunate so put, they feel like sellers. They, they do. And it's like we were so excited about them spending money two off seasons ago. And now it's like, wait, it's over already. Like you didn't even you didn't even go to the dance. You just you, you bought the suit and never put it on. Like, what, what are you doing? I don't know why I used that metaphor. That was weird. <laughs> I'm actually I'm actually hallucinating right now. That is going to do it for this episode of Rates and Barrels. Find Britt on Twitter at Britt underscore Droli. Find Eno at Eno Saris. Find me at Derek Van Riper. Of course, get a subscription to The Athletic, 33% off at theathletic.com slash Rates and Barrels. We are back with you on Monday. Thanks for listening.